1960, he moved from uh, Vancouver to the Madison, where he worked on the genetic code, and as we all know, won, was awarded the Nobel Prize for that work. And while there, he also synthesized a gene for the first time, another really uh, important <coughs> development in genetics. In 1970, he moved from Madison to Cambridge, MIT, where he stayed for the rest of his life. And while at Cambridge in, uh, at MIT, he also again synthesized a gene, another gene, a longer gene than the one he had first synthesized. And for most importantly, showed that this gene, chemically synthesized gene put together uh, through uh, enzyme ligations, when introduced into cells, worked perfectly. So this was, again, the first example of a synthetic gene being shown to be functional in, in vivo. And this is really the beginning of all the techniques that we know about cloning, genetic engineering, and the birth of the biotechnology industry really started fr from there. So that is really, and, and then at, uh, uh, while at MIT, he completely switched from nucleic acids to working on, uh, in a different area of membranes and membrane proteins. And there too, over a period of 30 to 35 years, he published some 250 papers and really doing trailblazing work once again and the phenomenal uh, work uh, uh, in that field. So, and this has lasted until basically his passing away. Now, uh, fittingly for a person of his stature in science, there have been international meetings all over the world, particularly at the universities that he had been. He had been. And this is, okay, so, uh, started with Cambridge uh, in U UK in 1985. Then a small meeting, it's a kind of an in-house meeting in Cambridge at MIT in 1992. This is just crazy. <laughs> okay. And then uh, uh, another meeting at uh, Vancouver, 1993. Uh, from 1993, there was a meeting in, uh, at Brandeis University. Oh, yeah, this is, uh, I am just, yeah. Great, thank you. <laughs> Brandeis University. And then from there, there was a meeting uh, at Okayama in Japan, 2004, and a meeting in Madison, 2009. And, and now, with the uh, uh, help of Drs. Ganguly and, and Sharma and Aurora, we now have a meeting also back. The, the circle is connected back to Chandigarh. So it's wonderful to really have this meeting here in Chandigarh, so in Punjab, where Gobind was really born, and this is where it all started. So with that, then I would like to introduce Marsha Rosner. Marsha was a student of Gobind's, the second PhD student that Gobind had, uh, and Marsha was at MIT, and Marsha was really more or less instrumental, I would have to say, in making Gobind switch from nucleic acids to membranes. So I would, having said that, I would like to invite Marsha to come and give her presentation. And Marsha, I've got, I don't have your title here, so. Uh, okay, all right, so Marsha. You, you can see my title, Rewiring Signaling Pathways in Cancer Cells. Um, so it's really a, a pleasure and an honor for me to be here and to start the meeting. And I'd like to thank um, Tom and, and Rajinder particularly for making this happen. Uh, before I actually talk about the science that I'm doing now, I want to uh, revisit a few memories that I have in Gobin's lab. And the stories that I'm going to tell I'm actually going to tell particularly for the students in the audience. So um, the beginning kind of is, how, how do you become a student of a Gobind Karana? So when I was a graduate student at MIT, 
Gobin had recently come, as Tom said, from Wisconsin to MIT. And at the time, Gobin basically had only uh, postdocs in the lab, about 20 of them. So it was a huge laboratory, but no graduate students. And the rumor went around that among graduate students that Gobin actually had it in his contract that he would not take any graduate students. So I remember him actually, you know, giving talks in front of us and we all went, oh, we don't even have to go because, you know, he won't take us. And so one day I saw him by the elevator and I went up to him and I said, Dr. Karana, is it true that you don't take graduate students? And he looked at me and he said, you know, I had one 15 years ago. His name was John Moffat. You heard about him yesterday. He synthesized acetyl-CoA, and he's now vice president of Syntax. That was pretty intimidating. In fact, I thought to myself, I will never even hear about acetyl-CoA again. That's a lie. You'll find out soon. And even more, I have to say this, Tom. Tom just told me yesterday <laughs> that Tom's thesis project was to synthesize acetyl-CoA and that John beat him to it. And so Tom had to change the title of his thesis so that he could actually graduate and get a degree. Anyway, so I looked at Gobin <laughs> and I said, Dr. Karana, would you consider taking another graduate student? And he thought for a little while and he said, maybe. Why don't you send me your CV? I didn't have a CV. <laughs> I was just starting graduate student. So I sent him my application to MIT for graduate school. And he took me on. So as you can see here, Govin only worked on big problems. And as Tom said, he had an interesting career. And somewhere in his middle age, it says here, I made a turnaround in my interest, turned out to be good for me in many ways. You can see a little hesitation there. So um, as Tom said, in beginning 1961 to 76, so this actually overlapped my time in the lab, which is around 72 to 80, um, not 82, that was all MIT. Um, he was working on the synthesis of a gene. And in fact, many of the people in this room, or a number of the people in this room, worked on that. And we, who didn't work on that, in the membrane group, the new group, called them the chain gang. <laughs> um, when I came, he was just switching to his interest in membranes. I can't say I'm really responsible for that, but it was part of this initial group that used to sit with him, and we would get together, and we would read about it, and we would be really excited. But Gobin, didn't quite want to move into membranes quite yet. As you can see later, he worked on membrane structure with Perul, who's here. He worked on bacteria rhodopsin with a number of people. And then he finally transitioned to rhodopsin. And you'll hear some talks kind of going off of that. But when I was there, his transition point was working on bacterial lipopolysaccharides. And actually, this was my summer project that became my thesis. Every time I would complain to Gobin about this project, and you'll see why in a minute, he would say, there's breadth and depth in every scientific field of investigation, and science is pursued in a variety of styles. In other words, be quiet and work. <laughs> so what was my project and, and why? Okay, so the idea was I was supposed to work out the structure of bacterial lipid A, and this is a very corona-type strategy. You take the tools and expertise from one discipline, to unresolved problems of another. I think this is what he did his whole life. He had a rationale here, okay? Lipid A is the core of bacterial lipopolysaccharides. Okay, why was he working on this? Because they contained, he thought, a similar phosphodiester bridge as found in polynucleotides. Actually, he was wrong, but I didn't know that for most of my career there. But there was a problem. Lipid A contained a diglucosamine core, and it had O-linked fatty acids. That's not a problem chemically. You can get rid of a sterified fatty acid pretty easily. But it also had N-linked fatty acids, and those are very difficult to get rid of. But Gobin, undaunted, came to me and said, I've got a solution for you. 
slime mold, dictostelium, must have amidase, it's that digest lipid A, because actually at the end, if you look at the byproducts, they have this diglucosamine residue. Somehow it disappeared and they eat bacteria. So let's break down lipid A with chemicals and amidases and we'll figure out the structure. So let me just rephrase my thesis problem. If any of you ever get tempted to work for a Nobel Prize winner, look at this. Unknown substrate, lipid A. Unknown enzymes, amidases, I should purify them. Unknown products, actually, we sort of had a product, it turned out to be wrong. And then I should find out what the structure was. That was my thesis project. So the philosophy from Govin in doing this was scientific rigor, intellectual integrity, interdisciplinary. It was wonderful training because I had no clue what I was doing and I tried everything that anybody in the lab ever had working. In the end, I had a thesis which was actually a centerfold in, in three parts. My husband did all the structures. <laughs> And actually, amazingly, I passed. I actually literally did the thesis in six months after five years. <laughs> um, I actually tried to quit at some point, and Gobin wouldn't talk to me for two months until I went back. So lessons learned, and I think these are lessons, as you'll see, that, that I've had my whole career, are try anything, be fearless, and the key is never give up. So, um, I just want to spend a couple of minutes saying what was it like to work in the Corona lab. This is one of the early years when I was there, and some of you may recognize yourselves. Uh, I won't point them out, but you can see Gobin in the middle. Whoops. Whoa, what did I just do? Okay. So what was it like? One day I come in, Saturday, 9 a.m., note from Gobin. I was here. Where were you? So main thing. Everybody who's worked in Goldman's lab know you show up and you be in the lab 24-7. You drink hard, mostly Josephine's coffee. I never drank coffee before. I don't drink coffee since. I drink lattes. Play hard. We used to go to the Muddy Charles who would have beer sessions with kids and dogs. Robant Sietrich, who was great. But most of all, it was just wonderful to be part of this Corona family. Had such great colleagues, past, present, and future, and, and I really feel very grateful to have had that opportunity and also to work with Tom, who is very much an integral part of this group. How has my experience with Gobin influenced my scientific career? Uh, I'm kind of a bit of an outlier anyway, but I think it's had huge influence. And the first one is, big problem, decided to work on cancer. This is kind of tiny. So um, at this point, I'd like to switch and just uh, give you a little flavor of some of the things that we're doing in my laboratory. So as I said, the, the problem I chose was to work on cancer, eventually. And um, the two actually biggest diseases, at least in the US, are heart disease and cancer. And even though this is kind of an older slide, you can see, let's see if I can get this to work, um, that heart disease, we've, we've actually done a great job um, dealing with heart disease, in part because actually it's one disease. But cancer has really been largely intractable. It's really been very difficult. So I want to talk a bit about why that is. But the cancer that we focused on is breast cancer. So um, that's really the, the major women's cancer. And um, it's responsible for almost 30% of women's cancers and uh, over 15% of women's deaths from cancer. And in particular, um, learning from Gobin, right? Don't take the easy one, take the hard one. So we focused on triple negative breast cancer. Those are tumors that are estrogen receptor negative, progesterone receptor negative, HER2 negative. It's about 15 to 20% of breast cancers. It's the most aggressive subtype of breast cancer. There are no targeted therapies for this type of cancer. At least in the US, it disproportionately affects African Americans and lower income women and it's poor response to chemotherapy or even known targeted therapies. So I thought that, that's a good one to look at. So why is cancer such a difficult disease to treat? I think this, the answer is very simple. It's one word and that it's a heterogeneous disease. It's not one disease. So most cancers have complicated origins. For solid tumors, what actually kills you is not the primary tumor itself, but actually dissemination or metastasis. 
A metastasis is characterized by many distinct biological states, and they're actually driven by stress in the environment. So hypoxia, you don't have enough oxygen, you don't have enough nutrients, and so the cells are driven to move out. And um, down below is just a, a scheme of a primary tumor moving either through blood vessels or lymph vessels to another site, and that's what's termed a metastasis. So what do I mean by heterogeneity in cancer? It's sort of extraordinary, the heterogeneity in cancer. First, different tissues, as we all know, have different cancers. But then, as I just alluded to, even if you say, OK, I have one type of cancer, like breast cancer, there are different subtypes of that cancer. So I told you I'm focusing on triple negative. But then, just take a single cancer in a single person. It turns out the cells are not the same. There's a lot of heterogeneity between the cells within a single tumor. That heterogeneity can be genotypic, so it can actually be in the level of DNA. It can even be phenotypic. You can have the same genotype, but actually a different phenotype, a different uh, set of genes stochastically expressed within those cells. So there's a lot of variance there. Different subcellular signaling pathways. So that's really what I do, signal transduction. Got into the field before they called it that. So you can have many signaling pathways getting you to the same end. So there's enormous complexity. But even more, every tumor is unique. So people now talk about precision medicine, individualized medicine in cancer. But what's most important and usually ignored is that tumors are dynamic, that actually they undergo an evolutionary change with time in response to stress and the microenvironment. So it's this heterogeneity, actually, that prevents treatment. Frankly, we could kill cancer cells, no problem. We would kill you, too. Because normal cells basically have the same signaling pathways that cancer cells have. They've just gone awry in the cancer cells. So for those in the cancer field, we really have three goals. We either need to selectively kill cancer cells, or we need to reprogram those cells to eliminate metastatic disease so that they can now be sensitive to the kinds of treatment we normally use, like chemotherapy. And we have to overcome resistance to treatment, which usually, in the end, is what kills you. And the major challenge, which I think a lot of people don't realize, is that single drug treatment is largely ineffective. So even though a lot of targeted drugs have been identified, for instance, the poster child is melanoma, there's a particular mutation, that is responsible for it. It's called V600 in RAF. If you ha use a drug to block that RAF, works beautifully. Almost 99% cure for four to seven months, and then bam, it's back. So it's really been ineffective. And the key challenge then is to identify synergistic drug combinations, or now drug combinations in combination with immunotherapy. Some of you may have heard about this. This is really the most exciting aspect, I would say, of, of cancer therapy right now and together to eliminate the cellular fitness of cells as they're evolutionarily changing and eliminate their ability to adapt to their environment. And just to give an analogy, um, whoops. This is sort of what um, signaling pathways look like in cancer cells, <laughs> kind of like a hairball. And the analogy for me is like a roadmap. So you can imagine I'm gonna go from Memphis to Miami. I've got a nice path. I'm going to use a drug, I'm going to block it, and then whoever's driving says, well, I think I'll go to Boston first. So there are many, many ways of workaround. And so the key is, how do you stop that? How do you actually minimize and block the pathways? So how does this framework inform how we might approach treatment of tumor cells? So this is um, a strategy that we've suggested, and this is actually a Mac PC problem. Mike and I were saying, wow, great, no problem going from Mac to PC, but this didn't quite work. So um, I'll just kind of tell you, you can sort of get an idea. Forget that top part and go down here. This is a picture of a heterogeneous tumor, so you can imagine that there's kind of two colors of cells there going to a homogeneous tumor, so one color. And then you use targeted drugs, and you can actually kill. And the analogy, which I was really alluding to before, is when you have heterogeneity in a tumor, 
the more aggressive tumors tend to actually have more heterogeneity, whether it's phenotypic or genotypic. And so you can imagine, I'm married to a physicist, so I like to think about things like a physicist. Um, here's a variance curve, and you can imagine it's a very broad variance curve. And let's say here's the fitness line, and if you're using a drug, you can kill all the cells here, but you still have these outliers that are living. So the goal is, can we narrow this variance, let's say here, put it in the space where now they're vulnerable, and then hit them with a target drug. So hopefully that's clear, even though the slide is not. Um, and I'll, I'll say in a minute, we focused on a protein that we identified called BAC1, where this is where it's expressed, and more heterogeneous, more aggressive tumor, normal tumor, normal aggressive tumor. <laughs> and this is where we've taken it down. So I want to tell you a little bit about BAC1. So BAC1 is a heme binding transcription factor. It's called BTB and CNC homology 1. It's a basic leucine zipper transcription factor. And it forms a homodimer or a heterodimer with small MAFs. Um, in general, when it's binding with MAFs, it's actually a repressive factor. So it turns things off, doesn't turn things on. And it regulates genes involved in the oxidative stress response. So I said it's heme binding, so you can sort of see the link, and I'll show it to you a little more directly later. And hypoxia induces BAC1 expression. So I told you that metastatic cells tend to be in a hypoxic environment. So this does not characterize every single metastatic cell, but it characterizes a fair fraction of metastatic cells where BAC1 is induced. So we originally showed that BAC1 is able to promote metastasis. And if you, um, if you actually suppress BAC1, let's say with shRNA, then, whoops, keep doing that because I don't know where the pointer is. Um, this is an example of a tumor <coughs> in a mouse, and that's the normal tumor. And actually, this tumor, even though it looks like it's in the brain and in the head, it's actually in the skull. So it's actually a bone tumor. It's a derivative, those who are, know anything about this, of M an MDA231 cell um, derived by masticase. So it's bone tropic and weirdly goes, goes to the skull. If we get rid of BAC1, then pretty much you've pretty much wiped out the metastasis. This is a, met um, a metastatic tumor. You wipe it out. And then we can rescue it with downstream genes. So we kind of worked out signaling pathway for it. Um, again, those of you who are familiar with signal transduction would know about the MAP kinase pathway, which has really been a focus of a lot of my work. And um, so BAC1 is down here. And BAC1 is a target of the MAP kinase pathway. So MAP kinase stabilizes MYC, and MYC turns on BAC1. And BAC1 actually suppresses a microRNA. Oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong place. BAC one's here. So um, MYC turns on um, LIN28, and LIN28 is um, an inhibitor of processing of a microRNA LET7, and LET7 actually is a suppressive microRNA, and BAC1 is the, a target of LET7. So basically, um, if you activate the MAP kinase pathway, you can lead to activation of BAC1, and that leads to other factors that are involved in metastasis, like matrix metalloproteinases, like MMP1, or CXCR4, which is involved in the ability of circulating tumor cells to adhere to metastatic sites. So it's, it's a metastatic factor pretty good. Can we learn something about it? We actually went back into human data, and we asked, OK, is BAC1 then more elevated in, let's say, triple negative or so-called basal-like subset of breast cancer rather than non-basal? And the answer was yes, it, it is, as shown here. We actually, based on that signaling pathway, made a gene signature. And so we started with a metastasis suppressor called RKIP, RAF kinase inhibitory protein. And um, we didn't have actually LET7 at the time in terms of the targets, so we kind of made up some. And BAC1, we identified some of the BAC1 targets put them together with some of these downstream guys. And with a gene signature of about 30 genes, we could take, um, let's say, 871 patients with breast cancer and show that the ones that had this gene signature are more likely, um, this is actually um, months. So, uh, sorry, this is years, excuse me. So they're more likely to, to die. This is metastasis-free survival. So 
this is normal, and this is those with the gene signature, they're more likely to die. And even those that are among the triple negative, this gene signature can stratify them and find the worst patients. So now we can find patients, but how do we treat these patients? So that kind of took us to the next stage. So we wanted to ask, what are other functions of BAC1, let's say in breast cancer cells? And to do that, we went back to gene expression, just cell lines, and asked, okay, what genes are turned on when you, um, and what genes are turned off when you get rid of BAC1 compared to control? And here we actually had a surprise, because there was one signature that just kind of was in our face, and that was essentially energy. If it's cellular components, it was mitochondria and biological processes was energy. So all of a sudden, I'm working on metabolism. I had to take metabolism in graduate school. I even had a professor that made me figure out how all the electrons moved in the TCA cycle. And I thought, I never have to do this again. And there we go, acetyl-CoA. See, I told Tom it's gonna show up again. So just to remind you, if you look at energy processing in cells, there were really um, two, two aspects of it. One is called glycolysis. So you start out with glucose, end up with pyruvate, and pyruvate can go two directions. So if it's glycolysis, you end up with lactate. A lot of people become lactate intolerant later. This is called the Warburg effect because in cancer cells, this is actually the dominant way that you generate energy. It's not very efficient in terms of ATP, but it actually gives byproducts to lead to biosynthesis, biosynthetic intermediates, which are needed to, to make more cells, which essentially is what you do in cancer. Um, normally, though, pyruvate then gets uh, processed to acetyl-CoA, with pyruvate dehydrogenase, then goes through the TCA cycle, then goes through the electron transport chain. You can see NADH goes to NAD here as one byproduct. NAD is very important for biosynthetic intermediates and then ATP. So basically cancer cells used what we call now aerobic glycolysis, primarily up here, but they used some of this as well. So what's BAC1 doing? Well, we were stunned to actually see that what BAC1 was doing was regulating all these enzymes in the electron transport chain. Okay, this is a major process. It's actually suppressing them. So when we take down BAC1, we're inducing them which is what I'm showing here. And these are some examples of some of the genes that, that we were looking at. And I'm not going to show you, but actually this happens directly. BAC1 sits on the promoter binding site and regulates these genes. So BAC1's regulating this major biological process. And in essence, just to kind of summarize what we were seeing here, and I'm not going to go through all the details, is as I said, normally in cancer, glycolysis is dominant and lactate's a major byproduct. You do do some oxidative phosphorylation, and reactive oxygen species as a byproduct is fairly low. And what happened when we took down, this is in the high BAC1 tumor, when we took down BAC1, we're essentially shifting the energy balance. So now it's more in the oxidative phosphorylation direction, and we're actually seeing more reactive oxygen species. I'm not gonna talk about that, but that's also an interesting aspect of what we see. So now that we saw this, we said, well, I wonder if we can actually take advantage of this in some way. Can loss of BAC1 somehow sensitize cells to inhibitors of oxidative phosphorylation? So have we now shifted the cells in a way to make them sensitive?